Good morning. I'm Donna from the Bartram Trail branch of the St. Johns County Public Library System, and I want to introduce you to Ben Williams today. And Ben has been a river keeper for many years, and now he has the Wetlands Preserve, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about a slideshow that he put together a few years ago about our beautiful St. Johns River. Good morning, Ben. Good morning. Let me pull up your slideshow. This is called Screen Share, and it's a nice thing that Zoom will let me do. And there you go, Ben. There is your slideshow. Our river, what are we protecting? Okay, and before I start that, um, it's good to give a little bit of credentials. I was one of the founding members of Riverkeeper, which at this point was 21 years ago and spent 12 years on their board. 40 odd years ago, I was commercial crabbing out on that river. We spent 35 years in the seafood business. I've run trout lines, set gill nets back when they were little. We owned a shrimp boat for a while. I still have a captain's license. We've caught hundreds of alligators, cleaned hundreds of alligators caught out of that river. We still fish recreationally. I've fished tournaments on the river for 18 years. So I have a lot of hands-on knowledge in addition to because of the affiliations with the various um, environmental organizations, I've had exposure to people with science backgrounds, which buttress what it is that we tend to pick up by direct hands-on exposure. I also serve on the Guanatop Talamato Matanzas National Estuarine Research Reserves Oyster Water Quality Task Force. And I cannot believe I got that mouthful out. So, you are amazing. Well, you know, I don't know about that. In the morning, I don't feel so amazing usually. But the, the question that's on that first slide is what are we protecting? is kind of answered in the next couple of slides. And it's not the answer people would normally expect. Because if you look at these slides and you focus on what's in them, and you can kind of get a sense of where they are and what's going on. Um, the first one in the upper left corner is the culinary students from um, Florida Community College watching us clean, process an alligator, um, Redfish being caught off the coast of Mayport. That's the Wilson's Children's Hospital tournament. Um, Luann is holding up a bass we caught during one of those tournaments. This is a gentleman picking up shrimp down in Palaka that he's caught in a cast net. Um, next slide. And this picture, what you're seeing is the east end of the Shands Bridge. Um, Bill Sabo, who used to write for the St. Augustine record, he did the fishing reports for the longest time. He would call these the mulleteers because they're out catching mullet. And it is a, a famous place for catching mullet locally. And the other picture is the dock in Palatka again. And these folks are catching shrimp. But the question is kind of a trick question because what you're seeing is people. And what you're protecting is a resource that nurtures those people people both economically, culturally, and physically in that it feeds them and gives them an outdoor recreation source. So you've got to think about it that way. When we're protecting it, we're protecting the resource, but we're protecting the people that are a part in a, in a, in a huge way of that resource. So going, going back a, a, a lot of years, in 1967, and we don't think about the, uh, the wins we have when we work on environmental issues. But in 1967, the alligator, the American alligator was listed as endangered. And that was before the endangered species existed. All right. And in 1969, there was a report in one of the newspapers that called the St. Johns River and Jacksonville in particular, the cesspool of uh, Florida. And you can read the dates on those, the screen of when these significant environmental pieces of environmental legislation happened. Um, 70, 72, 73. 
And then in 1977, Mayor Tanzler does his, to the young not famous, but to those of us who are old famous, ski trip on the river with the uh, folks from Cypress Garden. So all of that was back then. Fast forward to now, the alligators are recovered. Very, and, and we've got some slides about that in a minute. Anyway, we have improved the quality of that river. We've worked on it and it continues to function. And what we, where we are now is keeping it from backsliding it any, at all from where we've gotten it and pushing it forward because we can push it forward. So let, let's talk about a few things that are out there that actually do all those things I was talking about. And people tend to think of shrimp, if, especially the old school folks, and we call them river shrimp. But what we call river shrimp are actually one of the three primary species of shrimp we have here in Florida. And they are the Atlantic white shrimp, which is the primary shrimp that's caught off our coast, the most valuable one. We also have brown shrimp, which is a summer shrimp, and we do get a small number of them up in the river. And we have pink shrimp, same thing, small number of them. You would never, unless somebody shows you how to tell them apart, you'd never know the difference. And then we do have a few um, true freshwater shrimp. And those freshwater shrimp can get 12 inches and, or more along. Um, the males having very long claws looking almost crawfish-like. So the life cycle of the Atlantic white shrimp is that in April and May, for the most part, that's the peak of the spawning season. The, the adult females from the previous year crash the beaches, sounds, mouths of the bays and all, and they drop eggs. As those eggs hatch and go through the various life cycles, they gradually work their way up all the rivers of the Southeast United States, the St. John's River being one of the ones that they go the furthest up. They will get I've seen them skipping on the surface as far down as Aster, uh, regularly to, the, to Lake George, which is 80 plus miles from the mouth of the St. John's River. They, the white shrimp will take advantage of the St. John's River, which is in essence an estuary, and is tidal through that whole expanse to feed and grow. It's very rich in nutrients, and it's also got fewer pred predators, which is one of the reasons that they've involved this sort of life cycle. And then as they get to a certain size where biology says, okay, you need more salt than you have here in this river, they turn around and they head back to the ocean. And they'll start the heading back to the ocean. Some of them, the earliest ones, maybe in August, usually by late September, they're hard on it. And this is this explains one of the odd things that people that river shrimp, that shrimp fruit shrimp in the river, um, notice is that oftentimes the biggest shrimp are Palatka South and they can't figure that out. They don't really understand why. And the reason for that is, is that those are the sh oldest shrimp. Those are the ones that were laid the sooner and soonest in the laying cycle and have worked their way the furthest up the river and are reaching, a, you know, close enough to that size where biology says you have to go and they're getting ready to go. So then they dump out onto the beaches starting in September. They'll replace brown shrimp and what's being caught by the shrimp boats on the beach. And the white shrimp will make up the heart of the shrimping here on the East Coast. And that is the best shrimp October, November, December, January, depending when the water cools off. And those will all be Atlantic white shrimp at that time of the year. All right. In addition to the white shrimp, and, and, and I picked these three species because they all do the same thing in a certain way. The mullet, same thing, come up the river, they grow all summer long, and then in you know, generally about the middle of October, November, maybe the first couple of weeks in December, they will start their uh, spawning run. They'll develop row here in the river and they'll turn around and start making their way back to the ocean. This happens all up and down the, the, the southeast coast where mullet are. And they will actually do their spawn offshore. And same holds true for the shad. And you can see the shad there. They, their cycle's a little bit different 
but we still have the uh, run of American shad and hickory shad up the St. John's River. In fact, the St. John's River was the southernmost river on the east coast of the United States that traditionally had a commercial shad fishery. And it would sometimes last only a couple of three weeks because the fish here aren't as big as the ones once you get into Carolina and Georgia and further north and consequently aren't in as high a demand. Um, that no longer happens because they're caught with gill nets and gill nets are no longer um, available. But what these three species do and what the crabs we're gonna look at in a minute do is they all come into the estuary, they're feeding, they're growing, and then they're going to turn around and within their bodies, they're gonna transmit, transport all of those nutrients, all of that energy offshore. And they're gonna ultimately end up as food sources for so many of our coastal species. So in a way, they are how the St. John's is feeding species that you may not associate, that people may not associate with directly with the St. John's, such as king mackerel, such as cobia, and, and, and we can go on down the list. So they're very important from that standpoint. In addition, the shrimp and the mullet are um, very important culturally and economically to the area. And then, of course, I alluded to crabs. And, and regardless of what the folks from Maryland and Virginia will tell you, it is exactly the same crab from Nova Scotia to Brazil. They will tell you they've got something special there in the Chesapeake. And I cannot tell you how many crabs early in the crab season and late in the crab season when they're not producing up there from Florida get shipped to Maryland and to Virginia. And they eat them and they don't know any better. But having annoyed people with that. Um, in the first picture over there in the upper left-hand corner, you can see the difference between a male and a female crab. Now that female crab is actually an adult female. When I say adult, if you look at the shape of her apron, it's almost a semicircle with it with a little point. The male is obviously different. Um, you can see that the male's claws are not red. Generally there are exceptions, but generally they're not red. So you can tell male from female if you've looked at a lot of crabs, just looking at them from above. If you need to, you can flip them over. Um, the next picture down is an adult female bearing sponge. That's actually the eggs. And generally the sponge crabs will be in saltier water because they do tend to spawn, if not in the ocean, very, very close to the ocean in, in, in um, very salty water. And the bottom right-hand picture is we would call in the industry, call it a buster um, or a busted crab or one that, you know, at some stage in the peeling. And at that point in that picture you're looking at, there are actually three shells on that crab. There's a hard shell that's getting ready to come off. There's the one you can see underneath. And the crab actually already has the beginnings of what will be its next shell underneath that soft shell already forming under there. And the way soft shells are caught here in Florida is, in the spring, and then we also have another run in the fall. Traps are set by the commercial crabbers in close to the bank generally, but not always. Their first target is to catch big adult male crabs. And then that large adult male crab will be put in the bait well of the trap to be the bait. And every time the trap is run heretofore, as long as he is the bait, he'll get a little piece of bait and he'll sit out there and at night and the females are drawn to the trap, most especially the females that are getting ready to molt because it is at their molt that they are able to mate and they go searching for a male crab to cradle them, and which has the effect of protecting them while they molt and also allows the mating. And so in the morning, crabbers will go out, it might be every day, it might be every second or third day, depending on how things are go are going. During the soft shell season, the crabbers go out, pull a trap, shake all the little frustrated female crabs out of the trap, and put them in a, in a box, and they look at them. And you can tell by looking at the crab whether they're, they're a day or two, a few hours, maybe a week or more for molting. Feed the frustrated male crab, put him back in the water to do the same thing again. Take the female crabs to a shedding house, which is basically a bunch of four by eight trays with 
running clean water in them, sort them into the various trays based on how long they think it'll be before they're going to shed. And then every few hours, 24 hours a day, they will go, the, the crabber will go out there and check those trays looking for crabs that either need to be moved or are actually in the process of shedding. And then an hour or so, maybe a little longer, depending on where they, what they're going to do with the soft shell. Um, after the crab sheds, they'll take it out of the water. You let it leave a little bit longer if it's going to get shipped. You can pull it sooner if it's going to be for local consumption or if you're going to eat it yourself, you want to pull it almost immediately. Once the crab's out of the water, his shell will not get any, or sh her shell, most of what you'll get here will be females, will not get any harder. And the ones that are going north will be packed in straw or seaweed or wet newspaper and put in special boxes and shipped north. And contrary to popular assumption, um, soft shell crabs do not have to be alive because they quit eating days before they molt their digestive system is clean, they are kept on ice, and they can be eaten after they've been dead for a few days, as long as they've been iced properly. And then of course that upper right hand picture is some of the finest eaten that there is on this planet. And it is also a cultural norm in the southeastern United States, and one that attains here to the St. Johns River. That's deliciousness right there. All right, and we mentioned alligator. I mentioned alligators a few minutes ago, and the Fish and Wildlife Commission's alligator management program works the way we dream, wish, pray for that every other government program could work because the FWC manages through the I want to call it a tax, but it's not really. The excise that they charge on every egg through the licensing fees and through various other means, they manage to collect enough money from the recreational harvest of alligators and the commercial alligator farming that goes on, the commercial egg collection that goes on in the state to fund the total of the program. And, it, and from that program, they have managed to have a sustainable resource that continues, I think the late, last number I heard was 2 million in the state with all the folks we've got, it continues to support a commercial and recreational fishery. And here's an interesting fact. And it's not a hundred percent nowadays because this has changed a little bit, but for the longest time, and what you see there in those other two pictures is, um, that's Luann and a friend of ours, Scott, we're at Bienville Plantation doing an alligator egg harvest. I'm obviously taking the pictures and my job that day was to sort of stand and make sure the mother deck gator didn't come while we were stealing her eggs. And those eggs are, were destined for Scott's farm. Well, all of the eggs that are hatched out and grown to size on the farms, and a lot of them that got sold to other states were harvested in the wild in Florida. And the immediate thought is, how can that possibly be? Because we'd be killing off the alligator population. Well, over the course of a female alligator's 10, 12, 15, 20 year life, however long she's gonna be, the expectation is that she's only gonna have her and one other to replace a male or maybe one other. That, that, that's all that's expected from all of those eggs. And you can tell by the number of eggs in that um, tray there, how many eggs will come out of one nest. So the expectation is very, very, very low for the survival of these things. By taking these eggs where the survival is huge, I forget what the number is, 50 to 80 um, percent of them end up growing to size where that they're then used for meat and skins it doesn't have any effect on the population in the wild. And so anyway, it is, it is a proven and sustainable practice. And, and this is one of those environmental wins. Proper management has allowed economics, culture, 
food, recreation, all of these things to go on by protecting the resource and nurturing the resource. Ben, may I ask you a question? Yes. Do the farmed alligators ever reproduce? If I say no, I'm probably wrong because the technology of the farming is constantly advancing. And at what one time, pretty much five to six feet long was as big as they could economically grow them at the farms. But with better techniques and a greater understanding of the science of getting them to grow, they managed to change that. And it's very pot, and, and I know that there are some places where the farms actually have some semi natural areas and they are collecting eggs from their own alligators. Thank you, Ben. That's very interesting. All right, one other fishery, and this is, this is a dying fishery, but traditionally, it would have gone on, it was, it was a big deal in the St. John's River. And what you're seeing is three different, the three different primary methods of catching catfish. Nowadays we have farm catfish, which are not particularly good as far as I'm concerned. We used to sell them in the market because people would sometimes ask for them. But most of our customers wanted wild caught catfish, small wild caught catfish, because they had more flavor. It's kind of like a wild blueberry. If you've ever had wild blueberries, and we have lots of wild blueberries here in Florida, we have a bunch of them on our place and we pick wild blueberries. You eat one of them. Yes, they're smaller. Yes, they're harder to pick. Yes, they're, you know, they're, they're not these big, huge, juicy things, but the flavor is there. It, it's, it's completely different from that pretty, juicy, squishy thing that's kind of got a hint of flavor that you get in the grocery store. But anyway, I digress. The upper left hand corner is a hoop net. And hoop net is baited normally with soybean cake nowadays. Catfish wander in there. Fishermen pull up every day and you can see this gentleman here is rolling one into his boat. Um, there's a opening on one side. They roll, dump all the catfish into the boat. Uh, trot line is pretty obvious. You can see what it is. It's sort of like an inland version of a long line as would be used for swordfish or tuna. Uh, the bait can run from anything from tinfoil. Yes, I know tinfoil, but at times it is what they bait with. And soap to mealworms to single grass shrimp, which are little tiny things. Um, any number of other things. And then there's uh, fish weirs, which are traps that basically where the catfish wander in. And there used to be numbers of these down around Palatka. The last few stakes and the like of them, um, you might still be able to find one or two stakes sticking up where they were in, um, forget the name of it, Murphy's Creek. There might still be a few stakes you can see in there, but they were in the main stem of the river. And again, this has all been sort of supplanted by the commercial farms, which of course gets subsidization, and, and I won't go there. Well, thank you, Ben. Sometimes it's better that way. Oh. All right, I alluded to Riverkeeper a little while ago. And before Riverkeeper, we had Steward of the, Stewards of the St. Johnson. I was on the board of Stewards of the St. Johnson. We weren't getting anywhere. And when the idea of a Riverkeeper organization was put forward, I went and read the Riverkeeper book, talked to the folks that were discussing trying to get, in, get one of these put together um, and said, okay, yes, this makes sense. This is, this is a good idea. And Riverkeeper is an advocate for the river. And by that, I mean, we kind of force the regulators and the politicians to do their job and we give them a bit of cover when they do do their job by patting them on the back, by pointing out the good thing that they've done. And we're very fortunate here in Northeast Florida where River Keeper is located, thanks to JU, their offices are at Jacksonville University, in that we have had very good bipartisan support for protection of the river. And, and that's a beautiful thing. Uh, I always use John Thrasher as a uh, example, him, 
having been president of the Senate, and he's now over at um, Florida State University. John didn't live on the river, didn't fish, didn't really have a connection. And yet when protecting the river and the reasons for protecting, protecting it were put before him while he was there, he stepped up and did something about it. And he's an example, but he's not a lone example. That happens. We, we've seen help on the river from both sides. But the question is, is Riverkeeper enough? And Riverkeeper is not enough because in, an environmental organization, they're kind of the spear point. They are the place where the dollars sort of collect to where when it is time to go to court and sue somebody, when the necessity for some science that says, hey, you guys are screwing this up. Um, the science says you can't do this. You need to have some place that has some money, has some resources, has some ability to make that happen. But at the same time, those of us who fish on the river, who go hunt alligators, who eat shrimp, who eat crabs, who see the value of the river, we have to make phone calls. And, and it's not just phone calls when the city council is getting ready to do something or when a piece of legislation is before the um, legislature. But it's when we see something wrong. It's when we see a water quality issue where somebody has done something or whether where an accident has happened because things that go bad are not always the result of somebody not caring. Things break in life. People with the best intentions in the world have things fail on them. And sometimes you're doing them a favor by telling them. So we need, the citizenry needs to step up and say, hey, here's what we're seeing. The other thing we need to do is we need to be thankful and we need to take advantage of one simple fact. And the fact is that most of our problems here in the St. Johns River are to this day, nutrification issues. Too many nutrients, phosphorus, nitrogen, and the like. Now that comes from point sources or outfalls. That can be addressed by advanced wastewater treatment and by reuse of treated wastewater. It can also be addressed by us individually, by the little bitty things that we can all do, which collectively add up to a big thing. One of them is how you apply fertilizer to your lawns. If you can figure out how not to do it, don't do it. If you are going to do it, do it responsibly. Figure out how to do it such that you don't put so much that it ends up in the river. And I could drone on about that, but we have 2 million people in the watershed of the St. John's and the amount of nutrients that come from their homes from their yards, from their septic tanks that are not maintained properly is huge. And two examples, Rivertown, that turbidity in that creek, and they did this three times and they got fined for it, failure during construction. And that's an old picture. I think that one's about 10 years old, but they've done it again relatively recently. Um, and, and, and that's a failure and they, and to their credit, they went out there and tried to fix it. They didn't do this on purpose, but they didn't put enough effort into making sure it not happen. It didn't happen. And Rice Creek, that's one of the algae blooms. Everybody's heard of the green monster. That was during the green monster. And that was just a basin wide algae bloom having to do with nutrients. And all of those sources we talked about and all of us that put fertilizer on our lawns and didn't do it as responsibly as possible. We're responsible for that in a little bit, in a little sort of way. I will proudly tell you, I have never put fertilizer on my lawn. Oh, no. I'm, I'm sitting here looking at the river. As, well, I'm not looking at the river, but the river is right there. Right. As we're talking. And this lawn, absolutely not, never, hadn't happened, isn't going to need it. If, if it needs water, it's going to come out of the sky, and if it needs fertilizer, well, it's just not getting it. <laughs> it's, what's out there is more important than a green lawn. So. I agree with you, and I really appreciate all the work and all of your time that you've given to the community 
to help protect this resource and to bring the attention to the river that it deserves. And I've enjoyed my time with you today and I thank you very much. Is there any last word you'd like to leave with the people who might view this? I, I do, and, th and this is, this kind of makes the case for what we are currently doing, which is wetland preserve, which is actually a timber operation, but we have conservation easement on 30, almost 3,800 acres of our land. And that is that to protect the water, you have to protect the land. You have to protect the uplands. And so land conservation is a component of all of this. And it's something for people to also think about and support. So in addition to supporting St. John's Riverkeeper, organizations such as the North Florida Land Trust, um, for folks that are further west, the Alachua Conservation Trust, that are working to get the proper lands preserved, they need support. And so we have to hit this thing from all angles. Well, thank you, Ben. It's been a delight. And I really look forward to perhaps talking with you again more about the Wetlands Preserve. Thank you and you have a good day. For those of you who view this, I'd like to ask you to like, share, and comment. And again, it will also be available on YouTube. Thank you and have a good day.